Hello, everyone who's just joining us. Uh, we're so happy you're with us today for this webinar. Um, we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes once we get a chance to bring everybody in from the waiting room. Hello to everyone who's just joining us. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'll give people just another minute or two to come in from the waiting room and then we'll get started. All right, hello everyone. My name is Charlie Francis. I'm a Deputy Program Director with the Council State Governments Justice Center. Thank you for joining us for our third session in our Summer Fall Housing Webinar Series, Thinking Outside the Box, Cross-Sector Strategies to Create Housing Opportunities. Um, we've had a great first couple sessions focused on some basics around partnership building, key housing partners, assessing housing needs and doing quality screening and being able to prioritize people with justice involvement for housing. Today, we're excited to dive even more in depth into some key developing concepts and housing models um, that are particularly applicable to those of you who sit within the justice system, as well as other partners who are really looking to be a part of moving the needle on housing development in your community. Next slide. So we are a national nonprofit, not partisan organization, combining the power of a membership association with policy and research expertise, really focused on increasing public safety and strengthening communities. Um, that is our mission, what we do at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. And on the next slide, um, we're very pleased, as always, to have the support of the US Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance for this series. Um, BJA provides leadership and assistance to local criminal justice programs to improve and reinforce the nation's criminal justice system. So we're always pleased to have BJA's support as we get this um, important information out there about how you can increase housing opportunities for people involved with the justice system in your community. Next slide. And then BJA is funding us under the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program really focused again on this theme of this webinar, promoting innovative cross-system collaboration to really help improve responses to people with mental health and substance use disorders involved in the criminal justice system. Next slide. And we're very pleased today to have our partners from the Corporation for Supportive Housing who will be uh, 
presented the lion's share of the content today. Um, CSH is a national champion for supportive housing, and it has created hundreds of thousands of real homes for people who desperately need them. They provide funding, expertise, and advocacy to really, again, do what we're trying to talk about today, move the needle and increase access to and availability of housing, particularly for some of the most vulnerable people that we serve. Next slide. So today's agenda, after a brief welcome and some introductions in the chat, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues from CSH to dive right into concepts and strategies for housing development. Um, so we're gonna have several modules uh, talking about that topic. And then we have a couple of guests from us. Uh, we have representatives from Native American Connections in Phoenix, Arizona, and the Fortune Society in New York, New York, um, to talk about um, what they have done in their communities to really um, increase access to housing, some of the successes that they've seen, some of the challenges they've faced along the way. So you can really see how these successful programs have gotten up and running and think about what it might look like to do something like that in your community. Next slide. So um, we have a great healthy attendance, almost 200 people so far. So as always, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat and say hello. Let us know your name, your agency, where you're from, kind of what sector you sit within. And we would love to hear uh, one thing, if you've been with us for either of the previous two sessions, something that you've learned or something that you hope to learn today. And I want to remind you too that uh, we have a very packed agenda today, but if you have quite any particular questions, uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A function. And we'll try to answer as many questions live as we possibly can or at the end. And also in our office hours group TA session, which will be in two weeks that we'll tell you more about at the end of this webinar. Next slide. So this shows you where we are in the webinar series. We're halfway through. Um, <clears throat> we've gotten through some foundational material. We're going to focus on development concepts today. And then our remaining two sessions are going to focus on making business case for housing in your community. How do you show that um, there's going to be some cost savings to different public systems? How do you show also the impact that housing is going to have in someone's life? And, um, you know, so we're really going to talk about ways to capture both of those dimensions to really make a case for increased housing in your community. And then session five is going to be a session where we bring everything together and talk about some next steps for being able to do this work in your community. Next slide. So, um, so far in, in the office, at our last office hours, um, we talked about um, what, how, how housing partners prioritize people for housing resources, in particular, people who've been involved with the justice system, you know, with a particular focus on local continuums of care, but also housing authorities as well. Um, we had our community presenters from Austin joining us for a great session, talking about how they have developed that buy-in over the years um, and what it takes to kind of work with your COC to develop written standards. Um, we also had a great discussion about the locally developed um, housing screening and assessment tool that they have, the Austin Prioritization Index, and how it really does some innovative work to center racial equity in lived experience. Um, so it was a really great session and um, definitely encourage you to join the office hours after this session as well too. Next slide. So before I give it over to my colleagues from CSH, um, just as you continue to work your way through this webinar series, um, Think about, you know, if it was easy to create more housing for people who are involved with the justice system, you know, we'd all be doing it already. Uh, but one way to start to think about the different levers that you have available in your community and your state to do this is to think about different pathways to increase housing opportunities. Our first couple of webinars have really been focused on prioritizing folks for housing and supportive service programs that already exist. But today we're gonna to focus on a different pathway. You know, that first pathway is very important and we'll get you results sooner, but ultimately nowhere in the country is there enough affordable housing for people that need it. And people who've been involved with the justice system face even more barriers. So the second pathway that you wanna be thinking about in your community is 
how can we be working over time to be good partners in housing development efforts and increase our housing stock? Next slide. So without further ado, I want to pass it over to my colleague, Margaret Adams from the Corporation for Supportive Housing um, to get into the real meat of today's webinar. So Margaret. Thanks so much, Charlie. Um, really appreciate that introduction and really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, my colleague, Brian McShane, who is joining us today as well. Brian, do you want to come off and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, my name is Brian McShane. I'm an associate director on the CSH Metro team. The Metro team covers our work in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I myself uh, focus primarily on our Pennsylvania, New Jersey work. I'm based just outside Philadelphia. Thanks, excited Brian. to join over 200 people today. <laughs> I know it's very exciting and a lot of uh, varied expertise and, and diversity in the group, it seems like. So, a really exciting group. Um, uh, so I might, again, as uh, Charlie mentioned, my name is Margaret Adams and I'm a senior program manager with CSH. Uh, I am based in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so again, very pleased to be here with you all today. And I'm going to begin with an overview of supportive housing. So, you know, there is a very diverse uh, group here today. And I imagine that some folks have a, a pretty really great understanding of supportive housing and that this may be a new concept for some others. So I wanted to begin with an overview of what is supportive housing? You know, what do we mean when we talk about supportive housing? Because I, I'd like for us to have sort of a shared definition as we walk into this conversation together today. And that we're on the same page um, and, and sharing a, a, having a shared glossary of terms, if you will, right? Uh, so I, I just wanna make sure that we're all aligned around sort of what do we mean when we're talking about this? I, I also want to just take a moment and, and mention that we do have a few slides coming up in this segment related to uh, racial disparities and uh, especially those in jails and prisons, since we're talking about uh, um, sort of access to housing for people impacted by the justice system. I, I mentioned this only to prepare folks and just make sure that no one is taken by surprise when these data are covered. We, we understand that conversations around racial equity and disparities can be difficult. Um, and this uh, webinar is not uh, focused on, on racial disparities, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't include this in the conversation. But I just wanted to prepare folks uh, for the material that, uh, that will be coming up. It's just a few short slides, but wanted to uh, set, the, set the stage for that. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. So what is supportive housing, right? Um, you know, again, as we enter into this sort of shared uh, understanding, right? Supportive housing is, oh, can we go back one? Yep, thanks. Um, uh, you know, we, you can see affordable housing in the center here, right? So supportive housing is affordable housing where we have supportive services providers that are actively engaging with folks, with tenants in flexible and voluntary services uh, that are, you know, comprehensive, um, and that we're also working with, you know, housing, um, housing management to support tenant stability, um, and really ensuring that that housing remains a positive community asset for the long term. We also uh, think that supportive housing, you know, we know that supportive housing is an innovative and proven solution uh, to folks in our communities who who have the highest barriers or the toughest, um, you know, the, the toughest time accessing housing and community. Uh, we know that so many communities across the country uh, uh, don't have enough affordable housing um, and we're really lacking in that supportive housing that includes those, those services alongside. Many folks who have been impacted by the justice system have barriers to obtaining and sustaining their housing. And so for a number of reasons, uh, supportive housing is a, is a potentially uh, great uh, intervention for, for uh, folks uh, impacted by the justice system. If we could go to the next slide. So there are, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a, a quite a bit uh, on, on uh, describing supportive housing and then also sort of financing supportive housing, uh, just so we can have some of those, again, basic shared understandings here. Um, so we, we're looking at this as sort of the, the legs of a stool that 
um, uh, we need for high quality supportive housing, right? We need property management and housing management, right? We wanna make sure that uh, the housing is high quality and that it is maintained again for the long term. We also know that we need to develop that housing, right? If that housing doesn't already exist in our communities, we need to develop that affordable housing. Um, and then again, these critically important supportive services. Um, we've got to ensure that when we um, are talking about supportive housing, we are including uh, these voluntary, flexible, person-centered uh, uh, services that, that go alongside. And finally, we wanna think about the project's relationship to the community. We wanna make sure that we aren't isolating uh, prospective tenants or folks that uh, we're trying to engage in housing. Um, we wanna make sure that those projects are firmly uh, um, embedded in our communities and have strong relationship to the community so that they can access things like employment, uh, you know, tenants can access employment and transportation and uh, all of the services that they may need um, uh, to, to really thrive in their housing. Next slide, please. So supportive housing engages households with multiple barriers, right? Uh, this is a, a list of some of the potential barriers that folks uh, may have as uh, we think about who needs supportive housing, right? Um, when we think about the, the folks who uh, have, um, you know, the sort of targeting tenants for supportive housing, we're really thinking about folks with multiple barriers to housing. And that if it weren't for the um, affordable housing being made available, some type of rental subsidy and those supportive services that these folks would not be able to attain or sustain their housing, right? This is not an exhaustive list here, um, but what we are really talking about is that we wanna make sure that we understand that uh, folks could have uh, multiple barriers and that really uh, when we're thinking about who needs supportive housing, it is, it is really these folks with, um, with multiple barriers to accessing housing. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we are going to cover um, some uh, slides on uh, some data about uh, racial disparities in jails and prisons. And so um, uh, as we go into these next slides, I just want to make sure that folks are prepared for these data. We could go to the next slide, please. So this, um, this slide, the, the data on this slide are from CSH's Racial Disparities and Disproportionality Index. And this um, index really is, is an opportunity for us to highlight this uh, by state, some of the overrepresentations of, um, of communities of color in jails and prisons. So what you can see here that um, the, there's a green, these green sort of overrepresentations um, where you see significant um, proportions of black uh, communities versus um, white uh, populations in jails, you can see that there are these overrepresentations. And when we think about the impact on, uh, you know, the disparate impact on, on these groups, we just want to also make sure that we are considering these as we think about the types of development um, and also you know, uh, making sure that when we're creating new programs or new housing, that those are uh, done with, uh, you know, these, these racial disparities and overrepresentations in mind, um, and that we're really thinking about equity and creating, um, you know, sort of reducing those disparities in our programs and in our communities. If we could go to the next slide. So this one again is, is a, a similar uh, across all of the different states. Um, so you can find your state on, on these maps and you can um, also visit CSH's website. There's an interactive, um, these are interactives uh, on our website that you can sort of uh, see where those disparities are. But uh, definitely, you know, this, I don't think we could have this conversation about folks uh, impacted by the justice system without acknowledging uh, these disparities. We could go to the next slide, please. So we also wanted to talk about 
supportive housing models and some of the advantages and considerations with these various models, right? So first we wanna talk about single site and you're gonna hear from uh, some community partners later on in this session that are gonna have some uh, fabulous examples of how they've, um, how they've done this. Oh, thank you, Brian, for, for putting that in the chat. Um, you'll, you'll hear from some great examples of this uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but uh, single site is really where we're thinking about the development of a, of a new development or rehab of a site that is exclusively for uh, individuals or families who need supportive housing, right? So some of the things that we can think about here are uh, some of the advantages to single site are often that we have um, mission-oriented developers and mission-oriented uh, um, operators who um, are also able to provide all of those supportive services on site. And uh, there's you know, a single point of entry. And when, the, um, when a mission-oriented uh, um, owner operator or sponsor is um, managing that site, it can also, lead to reducing barriers to entry. So you're often going to find that when you have a single site, um, it, it might be much easier to move folks with uh, challenging backgrounds, as an example, into those units more quickly uh, because uh, the, the property manager and the services provider and the owner are all, um, are all aligned. This is not exclusive to single site, uh, but but it certainly is an advantage of some types of single site um, uh, projects or supportive housing models. Scattered site is where the program may have rental subsidies uh, for tenants or prospective program participants where the services provider are working with tenants to go out into the community and uh, rent uh, apartments in the open market. And this is great because it provides a lot of choice for tenants and our prospective tenants, and they can sort of choose the uh, geographies and types of housing uh, that they are most interested in. But one of the challenges uh, or one of the, the sort of uh, considerations for scattered site housing, what we're seeing in so many markets across the country is that uh, you know vacancy rates are very low, affordable housing, uh, stock is very low. And so it can sometimes be challenging where theoretically folks have a lot of choice in their geography, but the realities of getting into uh, tight rental markets is that, you know, folks actually may not have a lot of, uh, may not be getting into the most desirable neighborhoods. Um, you may also find that it's it can be challenging to engage landlords or prospective landlords or property managers in working with services providers and taking uh, particular types of, of rental subsidies. So again, when you're having a scattered site model, um, it's important to think about having those landlord relationships or building out those, um, you know, figuring out sort of how to secure and, and build interest in um, property managers wanting to work with your uh, organization. Integrated model is where we're taking, you know, you could have a, 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 pro a property that is market rate, some affordable, some supportive, but you've got some sort of uh, um, set aside or a carved out number of units that are um, dedicated for supportive housing. So we'll go to the uh, next slide, please. So as we continue to sort of build out that shared understanding of what is supportive housing, it is a affordable rental housing, right? Um, you know, to the extent possible, tenants are choosing where they live and choosing their units. Um, you know, as I mentioned, some communities are in really challenging rental markets um, and for people impacted by the justice system, uh, you know, there can be um, additional challenges, um, you know, like crime-free, housing that may uh, try to exclude people with justice involvement from renting in their properties. But to the extent possible, we are really trying to think about housing choice here, right? This should look the same as if any one of us were going out and renting uh, an apartment, uh, you know, in the, in the community, right? Um, not only should it look 
uh, not only should it feel the same when, when folks are leasing up, but it should look the same, right? We should have high quality um, housing and you're gonna see again some great examples of that um, uh, in a few minutes. We also wanna make sure that tenants have a really clear understanding of their rights and their responsibilities. And again, as we, we mentioned, you know, this service participation agreements uh, should not be uh, part of the, the leasing process, right? That we really wanna do our best to separate um, these, these necessary supportive services um, from uh, their ability to sustain and, and hold and maintain their lease, right? So we can go to the next slide, please. All right, so again, you know, I know that there is a lot of uh, varied expertise here on the call today, but again, we wanted to make sure that we've got these sort of shared understanding um, just about what is it, um, what does it take to develop uh, supportive housing units. So we're gonna come back to our stool, uh, but a little bit of a different stool, right? And we're gonna be talking about um, uh, these these three legs of the stool. So capital, operating, and supportive services. And these are all critical in, um, in building out our project, right? So that capital leg of the stool is really how do we build our project, right? What are those financing sources that we use to pay for the cost capital financing, right? And then we've got our operating leg. And this is how do we keep that beautiful project that we've just developed, how do we keep that open? and running, um, you know, and we're gonna talk about different ways to, um, to do that in a few minutes. And then the services, right? This is the, the S in permanent supportive housing, right? Those services are so critical. Um, and this is, um, this is gonna be, you know, how do we think about the contracts that are gonna be needed to really make sure that the right level of services for the target population is in place and making sure that those commitments um, are, are ongoing. So we go to the next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about budgets, right? Now we, we understand the legs of the stool. And so how do we, how do we think about putting those, very, those three distinct budgets together um, to, to make sure that these projects are, can be made whole? So again, we talked about uh, those capital sources, right? This, um, this is for both hard and what we call hard and soft costs, right? So this is for construction costs, rehabilitation costs, acquiring the land, um, you know, those architectural renderings, all of those things, the design, all of that is gonna fall under your capital sources budget. Then we're gonna have our operating sources budget, right? And this is where we're gonna need to engage with those uh, rental subsidies that are gonna help projects sort of close that gap between the cost of operating the building and then what tenants are able to pay for their rents. Um, so, so sometimes that means that it's really important to develop these relationships with your public housing authorities to really understand who in your states or uh, municipalities um, are, have access to those rental subsidies so that you can make sure that you've got some, um, you know, that you can be made whole uh, with some of those units. And again, you'll hear some practical examples from our partners in a, in a little bit. And then of course, so services sources, right? So again, we, you know, how do we make sure that when we're talking about serving populations who have been impacted by the justice system or folks who have multiple uh, services needs, really making sure that we've got those services that are uh, most appropriate for uh, the target population that you're developing this housing for. Um, and that really is a critical, one of the most critical parts of, um, right, the, the stool would fall over if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't have that uh, services budget and that services support. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, those funding sources, if we could go to the next slide, right? So how do we think about, um, how do we think about where do we look for some of these sources, right? When you've talked a lot about partnerships in, in your previous sessions, and Brian's gonna talk more about those and, and roles in a few minutes, um, but we wanted to sort of make sure that you were aware of some of the most 
common funding sources that um, are, are made available, right, or that you, you want to try and access. Um, you'll see here that the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, is listed uh, uh, quite frequently, whether it's through the Continuum of Care or uh, rental assistance programs, housing choice vouchers. HUD has been really focused uh, 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 with Secretary Fudge on, you know, making, house, making housing um, more accessible for people impacted by the justice system. And so thinking about, as you think about these funding sources and you're thinking about, uh, you know, folks uh, impacted by the justice system as, as a target population, you know, thinking about sort of what what are those uh, priorities for some of these fund sources? So on the capital side, you know, you'll know, you see low-income housing tax credits, uh, community development block grants or CDBG, your housing finance agencies, federal home loan bank or FHLB, um, that's often a, a good source for um, some pre-development or gap funding. Uh, I won't go through this whole list, but um, on the operating side, you know, again, this is where you're really thinking about those relationships with your housing authorities, right? Um, housing choice vouchers, um, you know, emergency housing vouchers uh, that have that have uh, come through um, in the past couple of years. So uh, all of these are are uh, funding sources to consider. On the services side, again, we mentioned continuum of care or COC services grants. Uh, Medicaid waivers, uh, thinking about, you know, does your state have uh, an 1115 or a 1915I? Uh, what are those Medicaid services that you might, might be able to consider uh, pairing? Uh, sometimes it's state and local programs that fund these. They see these as a priority. Uh, we're working with a wonderful project in uh, Pima County where they uh, just saw the deep need to um, to uh, create an incredible uh, supportive housing program for, um, for folks um, uh, in their jails. Um, and uh, they funded that out of uh, you know, county, county funds. So there's a lot of examples um, of how you can sort of make these, make these connections. We'll go to the next slide, please. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of, of time on this, but we we've had, uh, uh, you know, due to the pandemic, there have uh, been a, a several new financing mechanisms, uh, CARES and American Rescue Rescue Plan Act uh, that have provided new opportunities. Um, so this is really just sort of a, a chart that can help um, communities think about how might you operationalize some of these, or thinking about what are you trying to do and what fund source might be um, most appropriate for that. If we could go to the next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna just talk briefly um, about how to put together this budget, and then I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to Brian. So as we mentioned, um, you know, you really wanna think about these, we, we mentioned these, um, these, capital sources, right? And, you know, when you're, when you're putting these projects together, and again, you're gonna hear from uh, our community partners who, who are going to tell you uh, the, the complications of some of these things, but you've really got to be thinking about what are these sources and how can they be used? Um, you really wanna be mindful of eligibility and timing. Um, you know, again, these are not, uh, as Charlie mentioned earlier, like, you know, if this were easy, <laughs> we would have we would have done it uh, over and over by now, right? So these can be very complex deals, um, uh, but you know, thinking about putting these sources together um, uh, is is really a critical um, a critical component of of those budgets. If we could go to the um, to the next slide, um, we also want to think about you know that supportive housing needs more subsidy and, and um, you know, we're looking for um, how do we sort of make sure that we get, um, you know, all of the, all of the, um, all of the pieces of, of this put together, right? So you also need to think about those sort of soft subsidies and how might you fill some of these gaps. 
um, whether it's through a more conventional debt, whether it's through um, uh, grants, if you receive a low income housing tax credit, uh, some of that equity coming back into your project. Um, but all of these things are, um, all of these things are, are things that you need to be thinking about as you're uh, thinking about how to develop uh, new housing in your communities. We could go to the next slide, please. So I'm not gonna get into uh, the low income housing tax credit in detail, but we did wanna give you just a, a real high level overview for folks who are not familiar with this program uh, because um, it is, you know, it is a pretty central uh, funding stream for um, developing affordable and supportive housing. And there are also a few states who have actually, uh, Arizona is one of them, we just recently um, uh, launched a state uh, uh, program that is very similar to this. And for the purpose of, um, you know, the goal of increasing the number of units being able to be developed. But this, um, this slide just sort of outlines um, you know, the federal low income housing tax credit program coming into your state housing finance agencies, um, your states will uh, issue at different time intervals, a, a qualified allocation plan, which is really how they are going to um, score. These are competitive uh, resources. And so this is how they're going to sort of score and prioritize different um, different pieces. So sometimes for supportive housing, you'll see that the qualified allocation plan has set asides for supportive housing or things like that. So when you're thinking about uh, accessing low income housing tax credit, you definitely want to be familiar with your state's QAP. And then your project will, um, you know, apply for those resources. Um, you, you'll have a, a syndicator that helps you identify investors and, um, and sell those tax credits essentially. And then the, the, those resources are gonna come back into your project uh, in the form of equity. So for the non-developer folks on the phone, we, again, I, this may seem like, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, out of your uh, scope, but as you're thinking about these kinds of things, you really do wanna be familiar with some of at least these most common uh, funding, funding mechanisms. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to, to lead us through the rest of this conversation. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Um, thanks, I Brian. just wanted to add something on the um, QAP conversation. So that um, qualified allocation plan, we, we're seeing fewer and fewer supportive housing pro programs come up without accessing LIHTC. And so it's really important if you can go look at what your state's QAP says, and specifically Q in on priority populations. So when we're talking about folks from the, that have a history of justice involvement, um, you want to really want to make sure your state is, is adding those folks to the list of priorities um, that can uh, get points in, in that uh, LIHTC application. Because um, not every state does. I will, since Margaret gave her state a shout out, I'll give Pennsylvania a shout out that we do also consider uh, folks with that um, background to be part of our um, priority population and uh, just wanted to put that shout out that uh, it's publicly available information. They don't get updated every year, um, but when they do get updated, you have the chance to give some feedback to your state's housing finance uh, agency and there's an opportunity for some advocacy for this population. So that's a great um, one. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about those other legs of the stool um, before we hand it over and start talking about what this looks like, you know, in the real world. But um, really want to just start talking about things from a, a sense of like preparing yourself for a new project. And we talk a lot about the capital and I feel like the capital and the, the development needs take a lot of oxygen out of the room early on. And you really want to think through all aspects of the stool, especially operations, especially because you want your product to last over a, a long period of time and make that housing stable and permanent for the people who are in it. So we can go to the next slide. Um, what we usually tell people is you need to let the who drive the what. So if you don't know who you want to serve with your project, with your um, housing program, um, you're not going to create something that works for the folks that you hope to serve. 
So it's really important that you know who you're trying to serve, what are the barriers they face, the communities they come from, their strengths, the support that they need, um, how much support and for how long they're going to need it, and how they want to receive them. Um, data can be a really helpful tool in letting the who drive the what and figuring out, you know, how many folks from a reentry population have behavioral health diagnosis or certain medical diagnoses or over a certain age group. But you really can't let the data, um, uh, I just saw a yay Pennsylvania um, shout out in the chat. Sorry, I got distracted. But you really don't want to let the data take over for actually asking folks directly. And this really being an opportunity to make sure that we don't especially use data to just further implement um, more uh, inequity and race inequity in our programming as we develop it. So this is really an opportunity at the earliest stages to engage the folks you hope to serve and ask them these questions that we have in that bullet above, right? What are the barriers? What are the service needs, blah, 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 so that you can really incorporate that feedback and design a program that works for the people you want to serve, not designing a program that those folks have to fit into. Um, there is no one size fits all for housing programs. There's no one size fits all for a justice housing program. It's going to be very unique to the community that you're in. And that's why listening and really being as inclusive as possible in the design can help. Um, and then knowing the people you're working with can help you make choices about the model you want to pursue and the funding sources. Different folks are going to be eligible for different funding sources. So the more you can kind of fine tune this in the early stages, the more you're going to be able to design your program. And that will influence the way you apply for capital resources as well. Uh, next slide, please. So it's important to do uh, a little bit of a self-assessment at the early stages here. Um, are, are, do you actually have a clear vision of what you want to do, how it's different from both what you're already doing and just what exists in your community already for the population? Um, and is everyone at your organization, or we'll talk about partnerships in a minute, everybody engaged in the project uh, on the same page and bought in? Uh, is there an understanding um, of the population you want to serve and why supportive housing is the intervention that will work for them? Some folks just need affordable housing. Some folks really need that supportive housing. So are you really sure you, you get who it is you're going to be filling your, your apartments with and things like that? Um, an appreciation for how long it can take to do development and the risks. We've seen some really innovative programs develop in, say, like the health and housing space and some folks from the, the health side that didn't understand how development works or LIHTC applications work definitely uh, expressed to us some of this frustration of how long things can take. So you want to make sure that everybody's uh, on board for the ride that you're in for. Um, the ability to attract development team members and partners who can help you succeed. So do you know who you need to partner with and how do you get them to the table? We can go to the next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit specifically about the operations leg of that stool now, and we can go to that next slide. Let me show you in a sec um, just how important subsidies are. And Margaret already talked about this a little bit in, in terms of co um, covering the cost of operating a building over a long term. We usually advocate for uh, a new project to create like a 30 year budget uh, or pro forma to really plan for that uh, project to be affordable and supportive over that long term. Um, we've seen some folks do like 15 year, whatever it may be, but you really want to think about the gap over time between what it costs to maintain a building and provide service and the amount of rent that vulnerable folks are going to be able to afford over a, a period of time. Some folks may gain access to employment. Uh, or more income in some way over the course of their tenancy. But arguably, if you're building your program right, you're going to have a lot of folks that are coming in at a very low percentage of area median income, and you need to be able to accommodate for that in your budget. So some of the, the operating sources we tend to see tend to be along those housing subsidies that can keep the rent at an affordable rate for folks, especially when you're talking about a reentry population that may face barriers to employment uh, when they come out. Um, so we, we see project-based vouchers that are attached to the actual apartment units themselves uh, or tenant-based vouchers that are more attached to the tenant so they can use them more of a scattered model with landlords that accept them. Um, 
there are specialty vouchers, the example being like the VASH or Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing that are, you know, again, this is like an example of if you know you're going to support veterans, you have a, a different funding stream you can tap into. The same with one of the soft subsidy examples on one of the earlier slides, the HAP in uh, both California and New York have very specific like homeless and disability requirements. So you really need to know your population to be able to tap in. Um, and then there might just be different city, county, or state rental assistance programs. And we'll talk about this when we go into partnerships, but this is where just aligning your priorities with other organizations and agency priorities can open up doors and, and create successful partnerships. We can go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna show these two slides really kind of quickly in, in succession. This is just a, I'm not gonna go over every line of this operating budget for supportive housing. But what it really does is just kind of show how if you were to build a budget without a housing subsidy and expect that folks are going to pay a certain level of rent and not make them housing cost burdened at what we can estimate might be folks income. Um, what you end up with without the subsidy is a six figure deficit in your net operating income over $300,000 in this example of a 35 unit building. Um, if you go to the next slide, what we did is we took this same budget and we interjected the uh, housing subsidy. So you have this uh, line in bold, the project-based rental subsidy. Um, and then what happens is that exact amount just gets added to the net operating income. You go from a negative six-figure NOI to a uh, positive with the interjection of that um, rental subsidy. And it really is just to further drive home that point that like, it can be very difficult to do supportive housing or affordable housing without uh, um, um, some kind of subsidy. It doesn't have to be project-based, but that's the one we use for this example. We can go to the next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about, a lot of times when we're talking about operations, we're really talking about a, a category that tends to be called property management. And most agencies that do their own uh, operating services, they usually call it their property management division or their property management services. So it's really important to, that you plan for um, a, a property management within your development budget um, and, and are aware of all the different things that folks are going to have to do. So these, these are folks that might be processing applications, receiving rent payments, ensuring ongoing physical upkeep of the housing. Um, there might be a model you pursue where one agency kind of controls all service and operations aspects. So they might be also coordinating internally, you might pursue a model where there's an organization that does the development and property management and you bring in another service partner. So there's time that's needed to, to engage and coordinate with those services partners within a project and especially in support of housing. Um, it's really important that when we think about property management in supportive housing, that they're aligned with the mission of supportive housing. Yeah, you know, we're talking about uh, working with vulnerable folks in your program. So this, this property management and supportive housing needs to be centered, tenant centered. Um, there needs to be education, training. They need to be able to incorporate the feedback of the folks that, folks that live there. They need to place a high emphasis on communication, both with the other partners, the service partners, but also with the tenants themselves. They need to be accessible. You need to incorporate elements of uh, and key principles of housing first. Um, in uh, scattered site models where you're not the actual landlord yourself, you may have a landlord relationship um, building and maintaining over a course of time. We should really see property managers uh, engaged in a cultural humility, trained in things like trauma-informed care, cultural humility, understanding that the folks uh, that we're serving come from different backgrounds and we need to meet them where they're at. Uh, again, it needs to be a coordinated effort um, with both the other members of the staff, external partners, and the tenants themselves, and then making sure that property management also sees themselves as integrated. So whether they're dealing with a tenant that is from their market rate unit or from their supportive housing unit, are they really working uh, the same way with everybody? And um, when, whenever possible, are they offering unit choice to folks? Sometimes at the project base, that, that can be a little limited. Some folks go with a master lease model that further limits that, but um, wherever possible, you wanna offer that just like everybody else gets that unit choice. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, we're gonna talk about the support services on the next slide. 
So just like the property managers have multiple roles, we also have many roles for the service provider. And that can be everything from the day-to-day -day engagement in uh, the residents in the services, the design of the service plan, collaborating both internally and externally, um, having some role in that admissions process, uh, but also things like maintaining confidential records uh, and fundraising. Um, and it's important that you uh, really are considering all the different roles that both the property management and the service provider are going to play, especially when those roles uh, intersect and overlap, um, so that you're making sure that you're creating kind of a, a very coordinated effort uh, within your program. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So when you're thinking about planning for those services, you really want to think about your, your agency's capacity, right? So what types of support services might you already provide? Is this about extending some of those? Uh, is it expanding? Do you have a staff available to manage additional programs and services? Are you going to need to bring on a new team? Are other service providers in your community appropriate partners for this project? So even if you are a service provider, are there other folks who have further expertise uh, that might be brought to bear? Um, and what additional experience or training does your staff possess and what do they need to be able to work effectively with this a few years ago working with a reentry population would not have required as much of an awareness of things like being trained in narcan or um, working with folks with an opioid use disorder but you certainly would need that now especially as folks are at a higher risk as they're re-entering so um, what, what are some of the things that you might need to be able to work with the population you want to work with and and do you need to outsource that uh, next slide, please. When you think about the staffing considerations, the first thing that you have to put into mind is that this is really difficult work. It's easy to overburden the staff and you need to build a structure that focuses on staff appreciation, especially if you have any interest in uh, low turnover rate, which can be really difficult to deal with. And most agencies are having a really hard time filling positions right now and can tell you it can be very difficult to see a high level of turn, turnover. Um, the more specialized the services you're going to engage in, the more money that's going to cost. You also might have different sources you can go to, but it's something you've got to plan for. And again, this is all consideration you want to have at the very onset of your project planning. Uh, there may be minimum qualifications based on the services and funding. So you may have accreditation or education ex um, expectations from your funder. Um, ultimately, you are going to get what you pay for. If you try to go cheap on the staffing, you're going to find a lot of people telling you at the interview that they could make just as much or more money at Target than they can doing the really hard work you'd like them to do. Uh, staffing is definitely going to be the biggest cost in your services budget, um, but that's just what it is. If you want high quality services, you're going to need to, to pay at a competitive rate and make sure you get good staff that are able to sustain themselves. And don't overlook the role uh, and benefits of peers. We have historically maybe looked maybe too much to certain levels of accreditation and uh, expertise uh, without incorporating the role and benefit that people who have lived expertise and lived experience, especially when you talk about like living through the experience of having to appear in court and go through the justice system and incarceration. Uh, it's a really crucial insight uh, that can make a huge difference in the amount of services folks. And finally, just the, to consider that a, a 1 to 15 ratio is pretty standard when you're talking about serving vulnerable populations. We can move to the next slide. Um, we're not going to go into this too much, but basically, you know, there's different sources and mechanisms for services funding. You have grants that come from phil philanthropy and uh, government. You have, oh, can we just go back? Thanks. Uh, contracts that also tend to come from government, sometimes from the private sector. Um, and then there's donations. Honestly, a lot of organizations go to all three of these wells um, to sustain themselves. I think the most sustainable long term is tends to be contracts, but a lot of times grants and phil philanthropy can really help uh, establish capacity, bring on new programs, and donations definitely help folks stay afloat and cover some of those things that their contracts tend to not cover. Uh, we can go to that next slide. My seven-year-old helped design this slide, and it's the second time we've gotten it into a presentation. I'm very happy about that. Um, we're just going to talk really quickly about partnerships before we hand it over to our, our friends from uh, the other organizations that joined us today. So we can go to the next slide um, after that wonderful visual of all the different partnerships. 
and just talk about what it takes to have successful collaboration. Just bringing a bunch of partners together doesn't guarantee any kind of successful collaboration on something. Um, so really, we, we need to think about the different roles that everybody's going to play and, and be very vocal and transparent about that. Uh, so we need to be clear on what are the roles that need to be taken and what are the roles that everybody's going to assume over the course of the project. Uh, you need to acknowledge the institutional bias you may bring from the history that your organization uh, has, has had. You really want to have written documents that spell out the agreements between all parties so that eventually when somebody assumes we were going to do one thing and we do another, it's all in writing and we can iron that out. Collaborative part participants need to understand that the nature of working collaboratively includes shared decision making, compromise, conflict resolution, time required for meetings, and starting with different bottom lines sometimes. And ultimately, we can end up with a shared vision for a project, but only after we take the time to suss these things out. And then I have one more slide before I'll hand it over. Just to kind of think about where some of these potential um, partnerships come from. Uh, so I think, you know, we have all of these parties, it seems like, identified in the chat, uh, which is great. But, you know, there's a, a lot of different potentials. Even when you're just talking about working with uh, justice population, you've got uh, service providers, behavioral health folks, um, community-based organizations, public housing authorities in your state. If you don't already have an infrastructure to either bill to Medicaid for some of your services. Um, that's definitely some advocacy that you could be doing around housing services. For some states, the Behavioral Health Medicaid Authority has been able to figure out, I know in, in, in Philly, we were able to, to um, reimburse providers for services through Behavioral Health Medicaid. Um, there's Continuum of Care, uh, Community Development Corporations, Landlords, and finally, making sure that you're partnering with the tenants or the people with the lived expertise uh, to design your program appropriately. So that'll do it, I think, for my content. I think I'll be handing over to Dee Dee. Oh, no. <laughs> we have one more. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so just uh, thinking about the different uh, partnerships and project development, I'm going to go really quick for the sake of time. Um, but you have, again, that service provider partnership, the partnership that may be for the um, property management uh, organization, the development partnership. And a lot of times, especially if you don't have a ton of experience with developing your own project, you may need a consulting partnership. And this is a, a well we go to a lot with organizations that come to us and say, we are a service organization. We really want to develop our own housing because we can't find it, or we've done development, but not supportive housing development or affordable housing development or something like that. We, we usually recommend working with a consultant that has that experience with those live tech applications, with accessing different funding streams, might even have some of the relationships you need to have to, to secure some of those partnerships. So really wanted to call out, I think it was something that we can say about each one of these partnerships and the different ways you can go about them. But that consulting partnership can be really key if you don't have somebody already at the table, especially in your development partnership that has navigated this space specifically in supportive housing before. Uh, next slide. Yep, and then uh, again, this is just a, a checklist really and, and ways of thinking about how you uh, evaluate those partnership opportunities. Um, you know, there's the benefits of the given partnership, whether or not you need to strengthen your development team, um, accessing uh, more development sites or RFPs. Um, you might be able to access competitive finance uh, or equity um, by bringing in a partner. There is a, a risk to um, the spread uh, of, you know, the, the mission spread and mission creep and things like that. But um, thinking also just about spreading out the risks that you um, that have financially uh, across different organizations. Um, skill and capacity building for those who might bring something different to the table. Um, there's a joint decision making that can sometimes design a better program. Um, and just like the terms of partnerships uh, that you uh, will benefit from over the long term. But you have to balance those with the considerations around accessing strengths and weaknesses, knowing who your partner is, making sure they're in a good financial space, um, and uh, giving up that full control. You always want to make sure you have exit strategies and a way for folks to buy out over the course of the development if things are going south at any point over the course of the project. Okay, next slide. 
Now I'm going to hand over to Judy. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start my time, so I try to stay within my time frame. Um, so I'm Didi Yazi Divine with Native American Connections. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, Native American Connections is 50 years old this year. Um, there's been a couple of federal policies, more than a couple, many federal policies that have really been impactful on the Native community. One of them is the federal boarding school experience, but maybe you've been hearing about it from Secretary Holland. We actually have reclaimed some boarding school space here in Phoenix and are telling the truthful history of that boarding school experience. The other one is relocation that happened um, during the 40s and 50s. And that was an attempt to relocate Native people into urban areas for workforce development to assimilate and to lessen uh, tribal sovereignty and to terminate reservations. And that's why Native American Connections was founded. So we were founded to serve the Native American population that, that was growing and moving into the urban areas and were socially disconnected and didn't have housing, didn't have the job skills necessary in an urban area. So we actually started as a healthcare organization and it was in that providing our healthcare that our clients, patients, our community members, our relatives told us that housing was an important key to increasing and stabilizing their health care. That's not new. That's not from COVID. That's 50 years ago that our community was recognizing the importance of health care and housing. So NAC, we provide a full range. When you're serving, I call it a cultural community. Not, you're, you're serving and you're thinking of people as your community and your relatives, you're gonna build a continuum of care. You're not gonna think about the buckets or the people or the designations or definitions that you're gonna start building a continuum of care that people need. So we run from shelter, predominantly youth, transition age youth shelter, um, bridge housing, some of the new motel bridge housing that sprung up during COVID, uh, transitional housing for youth where they're uh, learning to, when they leave the shelter, to pay rent and practice um, being a tenant. Uh, PSH housing, of course, which I'm going to talk about mostly, but we have over 120 units of residential SUD, substance use and mental health treatment, um, which we use as re-entry jail and, and uh, prison re-entry when people have been incarcerated and, and substance use has been um, underneath some of the trauma and, and some of that occurrence. Uh, sober living facilities, and then of course, affordable housing uh, for uh, that is just affordable to all people. So um, being a cultural community, we're gonna provide that continuing care and let people enter wherever they need to enter or want to enter or uh, can qualify to enter. And so it doesn't matter to us, it's really navigating into something. If they go into residential substance abuse treatment, we have then time to fill out some of the housing applications that they need to really have a stable, permanent place to live that's supportive. So uh, I think it's been really helpful to us to have that continuum of care. The picture that you're looking at is um, uh, in Canto Point. And I don't know if it was 2010 or 2011, but we went through a, a Corporation for Supportive Housing PSH Institute. So that's like how many years ago now? Uh, 12 years ago. And um, uh, and I'm going to say yes to everything that Margaret and Brian presented because we were part of that first housing institute and all of those legs of the stool and all those financing resources and all that. This is not easy work. I have to say that it is complicated work. And so really um, learning uh, those tools to really uh, develop the project. Um, so I'm going to say this, you know, this was a blighted property, which the government called blighted, but it was in a neighborhood and it was um, lots of crime and it was a, about a 1950s uh, mobile home park and we came in and said we're going to redevelop this site. And so how do you bring a homeless chronic a uh, homeless facility, and I don't like to call it homeless facility, but people that have experienced homelessness and bring them into your neighborhood um, and get the, and want the neighborhood to avoid the nimbyism that we usually uh, feel. And that is to, uh, to take, they, they care about the real estate values of their properties. And so by uh, removing a blighted property, we increase the real estate value. They want to reduce crime. And then by having a PSH that's 24 seven and eyes and ears on the ground and part of the community where 
you know, we're, we're integrating the community. We have 23 locations now in the Central Core of Phoenix. And I'm gonna say in most of them, that neighborhood association, the HOA is meeting uh, monthly in our facilities because we're embedded into their community now and, um, and avoiding some of the nimbyism when you try to bring a project into a neighborhood. So what I like about this site too is um, you bring people on site and they wanna live there. That, you know, uh, we want to provide high quality, safe, accessible, affordable places for people, regardless of uh, the challenges they previously had in the past. And that's how Native American Connections looks at uh, reentry, recovery, um, is there are, there are family members, there are community and our relatives, and we have every de desire to have them uh, become the next helpers in our community. And that's kind of that lived experience model, Brian, you were talking about of people that those peer supports that they've experienced it and now they're coming into this community and they're seeing this opportunity in their life and then they wanna give back. And so in our organization, we have about 200 employees and about maybe 35% of our employee staff are peers, people with lived experience, um, very common because there are a community and our relatives. And so they're going to come to work for us and then they'll become those long-term mission-driven employees. And we don't have to see the turnover that we're seeing now, you know, with staffing and, and all those kind of problems that we are, we are experiencing just like anyone else with the workforce right now. Um, I wanted to just say, I'm, I've got so many things. Oh, we have a single point of entry. This is uh, 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 single site or project based. And so we, the financing is anchored by the low income housing tax credit program and everything else that Margaret talked about, all those funding sources, and then anchored for the operations with project based Section 8 vouchers. And then the supportive services have a variety of funding sources. Valley of the Sun United Way has been our partner in supportive services at this site for a very long time. We used a fin uh, the financial model, the personal model to us of the right thing to do for our community and people that had experienced homeless challenges or reentry challenges. But we made the financial case early on of reducing cost in the Medicaid system and hospitalization emergency rooms, interaction with police and fire, and then uh, um, uh, decreasing the uh, criminal justice involvement. Matter of fact, we had to measure really tightly for the first two years at this site with Valley of the Sun, and we had zero reentry back into the criminal justice system uh, for two years after people were entering into this facility. I want to say, um, I'm, I've got some more slides, but I want to say that the one, there might be a listing, missing leg or mar maybe it's part of operations, but I didn't see it in any of your slides. And for us, it keeps me up at night and that's the compliance. So there's really, when you have 13 funding sources and you're layering all that financing and what Margaret didn't say is the Loan Housing Tax Credit Program is in US Treasury in the Department of Internal Revenue Service. And so you can better believe there's a lot of compliance in the financing that comes from LITAC. So that compliance is maybe one of those, another legs that might sit under operations, but it's a very important leg. And if you don't do the compliance of all those funding sources, you're not gonna get refunded. So I would just offer that in your model. Next slide, please. And so again, um, again, uh, Margaret and Brian, uh, I've known Margaret a really long time. And uh, Brian, there were so many things that you said that I can really resonate with too. And one of them is knowing who you're gonna serve. We know who we're gonna serve because we're mission driven. We're gonna serve and we have a growing homeless population and we have uh, you know, um, people coming out of the criminal justice system really that don't know where they're gonna go and end up at our human service campus adding to that growing homeless population. And so we know who we're gonna serve and the Native American population is still moving into urban areas. It's still growing in Phoenix. It was 10,000 people, Native people. When I started working at NAC 40 plus years ago, I won't say when, but 40 plus years ago. And now we have over 120,000 Native American people living in Phoenix. So this is a campus with a, a behavioral health facility, a licensed medical behavioral health facility, a residential substance and mental health treatment. And then um, there's a, a 50 bed facility. It's the white facility right there on the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. And then a 54 unit 
PSH site uh, with 32 VASH vouchers. Uh, so there's a priority for veterans. So combining those two sites, one, it was cost effective. Um, I need to upgrade that picture because now the, our utility company came in and put uh, covered the parking lot with solar panels and it's uh, reducing the cost of operations from solar. And it's also providing uh, shaded parking for our, our residents and our employees. But I love this site because um, we, we only work with architects that design for the population who we're serving. So we make them sit with the service population uh, for a day and they do what, you know, their uh, design planning of what the, uh, the, res the people that are gonna utilize those services want it to feel like, not just look like, but to feel like to them. Uh, our housing is always safety. And, it, and, it, and it's always um, you know, easy access and residential treatment. I mean, look at the location we chose. We chose a location that surrounded two sides by Phoenix Mountain Preserve. You know, we want people to feel that when they come to our place that they deserve this kind of uh, place to live and these kind of services. Next slide, please. And this is just a closer picture of the residential treatment center. Um, next slide, please. And then this is our transitional housing for our homeless youth. Uh, right next door is a shelter for youth. Uh, we're opening another 44 bed shelter in October, which I'm really excited about because we're one of the very few shelter providers for this age group. And this happens to be their, um, the transitional housing where they, uh, they rent a unit for 18, up to 18 months. Uh, I hate the timeframes that HUD gives you, but uh, that's the period. And, um, and they pay no more than 30% of their income. And I tell you what, we opened up three facilities during COVID and this opened up right before COVID. And I, I'm just gonna say people that were with NAC, because we're also a healthcare provider, we were vaccinating in our homeless communities in December of 2020, because we received our vaccines through Indian Health Service and we were sovereign about who we could vaccinate. So we were taking our vaccines from a trusted provider into the community and keeping our facilities open and safe early in COVID. And so, um, so I feel like people in our housing didn't have to worry during COVID because we provided uh, food. Uh, one month, June of 2020, we delivered 30,000 meals around NAC's continuum. And we provided rental and utilities assistance, made sure they had access. And they didn't have to worry about being evicted or not getting the health care that they need or with increased rise in domestic violence and suicide and opioid use and drug addiction. We had those services right there available to them in that continuum. Next slide, please. And that's just the youth facility. Uh, next slide, please. And that's another PSH site. Uh, that looks very different now too. I uh, should upgrade my slides. It's got a beautiful uh, garden courtyard and shaded courtyard. And that's actually a 120 unit PSH site. Uh, and it has a commercial kitchen in it. It has a 100 uh, person conference uh, great meeting area and St. Joseph the Worker, which is one of our workforce development partners, is co-located on this site. We have Fresh Express, which brings our fresh food at weekly. And then our medical clinic, our integrated medical clinic, it, um, does a lot of services, but we also have Wesley Community Center and FQHC, who's there one, one time a week. And I want to say we have Phoenix Children's Hospital, the, one of the larger Children's Hospital is our medical provider at our youth shelter, uh, right on site. So they don't have to leave to get the medical care ongoing primary care, switching them from using emergency rooms and high cost services to having a primary care physician that helps them um, improve their healthcare outcomes. Next slide, please. And then I just wanted to say, this is our talking circle room at the Residential Treatment Center. And this is an example of architectural design um, that really meets the needs of the people that we serve. So I wanted to say something, somebody was talking about best practices and data. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always talking about data. I'm putting it right out there. Our race data and um, the disparities in homelessness and the services people were getting um, is what helped change uh, our community to really begin saying that uh, we have a biased system 
in a, in a systemically biased system and systemically biased tools, the SPDAT that we're using. Um, and we need to change that. Um, there's a disparity with uh, predominantly Native American and African Americans and our homelessness and our unsheltered, not just homeless, but they're not in our shelters, they're unsheltered and receiving the wrong service too of rapid when they really needed PSH and then returning right back to homelessness when the rapid voucher expired. So I'm out front about the race data, but I wanna talk about this. I, again, I said, I worked for there for 40 years and we never use national best practices. Um, we always use them as a guideline, but we never saw them as how to serve our community. So HUD generally says that you don't have to follow as long as you have something. And we're using thousand year old practices, the talking circle, the sweat lodge, the traditional healing practices that have been practiced for over a thousand years that are effective for healing trauma, who are effective for healing the things that people experience in the prison system and when they're re-entering, feeling when you sit in that circle and you sit in that ceremony, everyone's equal. You're no less than, no matter where you came from or no matter what you experienced, you have this opportunity to be whole and people to listen to you because that's the responsibility sitting in that circle to listen and to allow someone to share from their heart. And that's the core mission of Native American Connections. And that's where I guess, I think I'm at my time limit. So I am a little, one minute over. So I'll pass it on. I'm not sure who I'm passing it on to, but um, thank you for uh, including me today. Yeah, so um, thank you I'm so sorry. much. I'm sorry, I just have to fantastic. say, that was incredible. <laughs> you always blow me away, no matter how many years I've heard you speak. I just thank you so much for the for your work. Sorry, Brian. No, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think we could dedicate, you know, a whole hour and a half to either one of Didi or Andre and what you, what you guys have to say and the great work you do. Uh, just real quick, introduce Andre Ward. Um, and then Andre, maybe even a bit better if you just want to do a quick introduction of yourself and Fortune Society. And then we just have like one or two questions to prompt some of the, the work that uh, Fortune Society does that can maybe provide examples of this work too. Yeah, sure, Mark. And just want to really acknowledge Dee Dee. That was a fabulous presentation, right? So everything she said, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> no, but it was fabulous, it was powerful. And so my name is Andre Ward. I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. It's a New York City-based organization that's been around for 54 years, offering re-entry and advocacy services for New Yorkers. And one of the things Hence the reason why we're here is that we have been offering supportive housing services to New Yorkers impacted by the criminal legal system for 20 years. And so when we think about our work, right, we always center it on like what is important to the people that we serve. Half of Fortune's 400 plus staff are impacted by the criminal legal system and at least 40% of its executive leadership, including myself, are formally incarcerated. So we like to say that we live our mission and we walk our talk um, because to Didi's point, right, making sure that the people that are most impacted are part of the discussion decision-making processes are critically important. We have 14 domain services areas that ranging from substance use treatment to mental health treatment to reentry employment education services to alternative to incarceration services, all of which have been developed as a result of the feedback and input that we get from people that are directly impacted. So I'll stop there and then I'll talk a little bit about our housing work, right? We, um, of course, since our founding, we have provided housing for thousands of formerly incarcerated people. In fiscal year 2021, we provided low threshold access to emergency transitional and permanent housing support for at least 470 people. And then I'll talk a little bit about our housing models in particular. A little bit later on. Great, thanks, Andre. So I, I think you know when we think about like what we've talked about in our content up to this point, um, and when you think about the like supportive service model that you guys have implemented at, at Fortune, mm -hmm. how does that relate to like when you're thinking about those three legs of the stool and planning for a new project? Yeah, I mean, I think when we think about the capital work that's needed. Right, one of the things that we did in partnership with Enterprise 
which is a New York City based and like national based funding uh, organization, we had created a curriculum to really look at how we're identifying capital to support building out this much needed resource in housing, particularly around supportive housing. And one of the things that we learned is that, you know, when you're talking about this capital funding, right, there's so many, it's so nuanced, right? There's so many elements, different funding streams, different people that you're looking to identify to support. And we thought about like, how do we organize these resources, right? What do we do, right? We look at different stakeholders like banks. We look at our city and state funding sources. We look at the federal and state uh, tax provisions as I think Diana mentioned or referenced earlier and you all in this, the amazing presentation you get, gave. And then we look at philanthropy and foundation as means by which to um, subsidize um, the work that we want to do from the developmental stage, right, and actually identifying the spaces, right, building out the um, housing in and of itself, and then the funding needed to support and service provision. So that's, you know, one of the ways in which we look at capital funding to develop and sustain our work, and we know it's so important. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes it's so nice when you hear that the stuff that we keep putting on our slides actually works in the real world or actually holds up. I'm saying that uh, we're not we're not putting BS out in the world. Um, yeah, I said is, to myself, uh, I don't know if I should give a presentation. I think CSH covered everything already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. well, it's important, right? You guys sure. are the ones out there doing the, the important work. Um, sure. Why would you say it's important to kind of plan for like your services budget at that early stage? And like, how do services and services funding support like new housing developments? Well, obviously there's a need, right? And I think when we talk about um, service provision within the housing space, right? We know that each are required and needed. You can't have one without the other. When you talk about supportive servicing, right? Invariably people are being released from prison and jails in need of housing. In fact, over 50% of the people that are being released from New York state prisons are entering into shelters. And we know that shelters, many of them are not fit for human beings to function in and the kind of capacity to offer really serious supportive services are non-existence in that way. So when we look at supportive housing funding, we know that that funding can allow us to create these opportunities to build community. I think Diane mentioned that where people can support each other as peers, get the kind of wraparound services that Fortune offers in our 14 domains of service provision to build their capacity to live a life of contribution, right? We have, for example, the Fortune Academy, which I think Diane mentioned earlier around these places that may not be deemed fit for habitation, but has potential to be redeveloped and redesigned to offer services. And that's what, what our Fortune Academy was. It's called the Castle. It's a 93 unit emergency and transitional supportive housing residence in West Harlem. And it opened in 2002. And much like I'm sure with Diana and other service providers have experienced, right? There was a lot of nimbyism, but our CEO, Joanne Page and executives, Deputy CEO, Deputy CEO, Stan Richards went into the community, was transparent, right? Let them know, let the community know exactly what was, what was happening and what we're looking to get them to support but also offering them opportunities, right? Whether they were residents or non-residents to access our supportive services. Similarly, we opened up Castle Gardens, which was right next to this building that had been a building where a lot of substance use had occurred during the crack epidemic, but there was a lot next to it that we built um, what is called Castle Gardens in 2010, which provides 63 units of permanent supportive housing for homeless justice involved people and 50 permanent affordable units for low-income community members. So that kind of buy-in, right? And that support, not only for the people that we serve, but for the community allowed us to really become a real staple in that area. And then we have, in terms of supportive services and the relationship with housing, we have the Mandela community, which opened fairly recently as two or three months ago, 2022, which is a supportive housing residence for homeless seniors in the Bronx, right? And we're providing 57 housing units, housing units for our target population that we serve. So when we think about our service dollars that we receive from the city to state in terms of service provision, 
we know that that allows us to be positioned to look for more opportunities to create housing because of the effectiveness of our housing models in the past and present. That's great. I think there's something to be said too. I know somebody asked in the in the Q and A, and and we'll, we'll be able to address in like our office hours, and maybe even in the next session around the business case, mm -hmm. around like NIMBYism and how important it is to be engaged with the community the way you're talking about to combat not just the NIMBYism, but you know some of the other frictions that can occur in a community. Um, Last question I had for you, Andre, um, and then you know anything else you wanted to say about sure. you know, what you think is is relevant from Fortune, but um, you know you talked about partnering with um, Enterprise. Um, I'm sure you guys have partnered with a number of other organizations. What support do you do you find you need from partners to deliver the programming that you want to deliver for for the folks that live in Fortune? I think one of the supports is that you know we just continue to be consistent, right? In our service provision offerings and that we develop a unity of action around doing those things because we know that we can always develop a unity of action without compromising our organizational identities. And sometimes funding could serve as a wedge between us partnering and collaborating hmm. with each other. And if we are consistent as organizations who have similar populations that we serve, and we're deeply committed to seeing that they're empowered, right? We find ways to work collaboratively with each other. So if I were near Diane, for example, I would refer people to her. If I don't have the capacity to offer beds to people who were really in need, I would reach out to her. Similarly, I would hope she would do the same thing, given her lack of capacity possibly to offer support and housing for people who need it. So I think it's those kind of things that we need support from in terms of other organizations and sharing out like models and examples, right? Mm -hmm. That can work effectively, right? Right now we have two residents in development. One is called Castle Three. That's an 82 unit affordable and supportive building in East Harlem. It's expected to open in 2024. That's modeled after our Castle Gardens. And then we have Castle Four, which is an upper west side building, formerly an illegal hotel right, that we will, will convert into 84 yeah. units of affordable housing, 59 units for formerly incarcerated individuals existing in New York City shelter system, which is really important. And 24 of those units are affordable housing for community members. So this admixture of the community and the people that we prioritize and serve, who of course we know are also a part of the community, makes it more better for us to serve the needs of the people that we serve and the community. And then, we operate over 239 plus units of scattered site housing programming, including 60 units of justice involved supportive housing via a recent expansion of our city funded emergency and transitional housing contract from 100 beds to 250 beds. And you know, we also provide our most vulnerable participants with safe supportive housing while they access our stabilizing services. Then I have a couple of other comments, but that's just a short answer to your question. Then I have just a couple other comments about some of the work that yeah, we Yeah, go for it. Please. Yeah, I think, please I add. think <laughs> the other thing is too, right? We offer technical assistance support for people. And I think that's become something that's really popular in the work that we do at Fortune. And we aren't selfish as an organization. We think that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so we support different organizations and groups with technical assistance and our expertise like really encompasses the development and dissemination of toolkits and issue briefs that enable us to share research and best practices with others in the field. We help our sister organizations replicate our program models like via hands-on technical assistance. One organization we work with in Syracuse that's replicated our Castle uh, Gardens model up in Syracuse and they're doing amazing work and we meet with them on a weekly basis for technical assistance, our CEO, Joanne Page and others. And then we are getting a lot of requests from different states um, fairly recently in Maryland, uh, Chicago and DC and Pennsylvania where organizations are reaching out to us to um, get support with technical assistance around supportive housing for people who are impacted by the criminal legal system. And then we've created specific toolkits, right? In combating housing discrimination and affordable houses, especially for those who are returning home from prisons and jails. Um, we have 
what is called In Our Backyard, um, Overcoming Resistance to Reentry Housing, which is a NIMBY toolkit. We have another um, tool that we use um, in technical assistance called Employing Our Mission, Building Cultural Competence in Reentry Service Agencies through the hiring of individuals who are formerly incarcerated and or in recovery to Denise's point, and how the Fortress Society achieved a triple bottom line with Castle Garden. And that triple bottom line was one, that we would be housing um, and supporting people with services through our housing models. Two, we would be financially sustainable as a building and with our services over the long haul. And three, how it could benefit the community. And examples of that is we offer food, fresh uh, produce to the community. We have um, Halloween parties where at one time our communities were somewhat fearful of us. Now we have Halloween parties where the children come and play, et cetera. We have community board meetings there. And then we have our last toolkit, which is a place to call home, a vision for safe, supportive, and affordable housing for people with justice system involvement. So we have technical assistance support, ways in which we give back to community and how we partner with community. Like I said, it's mostly all of what Diane said. Diana said, right? So it's a lot of overlap. And I had a picture of the castle, castle gardens. I'll see if I could share it, but I can't share it because I cannot share as a participant. But I had a picture of the castle and castle gardens to share, but it's fine. Um, just really no, Sorry about that, Andre. Totally fine. We're thankful for the opportunity to have presented today. Where can folks go to find some of that material you had? I think it was relevant to some of the things that came up in the chat. Do they just go to the Fortune Society's website or is there a better place? Yeah, for them sure. To they, take can a look? Go, they can go to www.fortunesociety.org and they can look for the resources there. Or folk can email me directly at award. That's A W A R D, like award, like I'm sure many of you have perceived in your lives, award at <laughs> fortunesociety.org. That's award at fortunesociety.org. You can email me and we can get those resources to people. And again, I really want to thank um, Corporation for Supportive Housing um, and as well as uh, the Council on State Government for putting this together. Really powerful. And we're really honored to have been a part of this. Well, uh, feelings are mutual, Andre. We really appreciate yours and Didi's, uh, you know, contribution today and wish we could have even had more time for it. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Charlie to talk about some of the next steps and uh, things coming up. And just one last thing to Diana, would love for you to meet our CEO, Joanne Page, and to talk with her. I think you guys would have a lot to talk about. Oh my goodness. I, you, this, this 90 minutes has gone by so fast. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. <clears throat> Especially, it's great to learn about all the great work, Didi and Andre, that you've been doing, um, both of your, your programs and the work you've done really inspire me. So thank you. Um, you know, we are at time here, so I want to encourage you all to attend our office hour session. Um, we will send out a link for registration to everybody who was here today. Um, it's free. It's in two weeks from now. Uh, there'll be another 90 minutes. We'll have uh, some of our presenters joining us again. That you can ask as many questions as you like, and we can dig into some of these topics in more detail um, because I know there's a lot of great discussions we can have around NIMBYism, around what it takes to get a project started in the community, and so much more. So definitely encourage you to join us um, for that opportunity and get your questions asked. Um, next slide, please. So our next session is a uh, webinar session is going to be August 18th, about a month from now, focused on making the business case for housing. So we've got the registration link here, which we'll also send out after this webinar. Next slide. And just we'll, in this deck that we'll, we'll send out these slides as well too. I know some of you were asking about that. We have a number of CSH resources, um, you know, particularly around um, some of the basics of supportive housing development. And that is CSH's wheelhouse, so we definitely encourage you to take advantage of these. And then we may have some additional resources on the next slides. Not gonna focus on those right now, but um, definitely keep an eye out for this deck for some of our Justice Center resources as well too. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. I hope this was 
interesting and informative. I know I learned a lot and we hope to see you at the office hour session in two weeks. Thank you.